morning, everyone. Let's stand. Happy Thanksgiving week to everyone. I should say bless, blessings, blessings of the Lord. Amen. Make rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Let's lift our hands to the Lord from our voices. Lord, we welcome your presence into this house today. You are so good. And that's an understatement, Lord. Lord, your goodness is your glory. Because when you passed before Moses and he asked for your glory, you showed him your goodness. And Lord, we are aware of your glory in our lives. It's all because of you, Lord, that we live and move and have our being. So we exalt you and we praise you today. In the name of our Lord, everybody said, amen. Find two or three people, tell them you're glad to see. every breath. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God.
thanks, Lord. I give you thanks. I give you thanks, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, you good, Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so.
this Sunday right before Thanksgiving. Express yourself to him. Amen. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who has forgiven all of our sins and healed all of our diseases. Hallelujah. We're going to sit down at the table on Thursday and celebrate Thanksgiving. But I want to tell you the true celebration of Thanksgiving is thanks living. Psalmist David said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How many believe that? All right, then find two or three people before you're seated today and say, God's been good to me. How about you? Amen. There you go. Good morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I remember the worship team used to do this song several years back, and it was, I was running to the, I went running to the house of the Lord. Well, maybe not running. It's too cold for us California people, but I was driving to the house of the Lord, and it's a good place to be on this Lord's Day. Are you glad to be here? Amen. I I was thinking about another old song our worship team did. Uh, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost. It makes me want to shout. You know what, sometimes, have you ever drove by and you, you're at a stoplight or a stop sign and you look over at the person in the car next to you and they are just jamming out on a song like their steering wheel becomes their their drums and all of that. Oh, yeah, the kids can go on out, too. Uh, and I'm that person that I love to turn it up when my favorite song comes on. And this is one of those. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah. They probably think I'm some old rock girl over there rocking to a 70s. No, I'm out there just rocking to Jesus, having an awesome time, thinking about it. You know what? I pray to God, don't ever let me forget you know what, we got to kindle the love that we have for each other, you know, in your marriages and with your children and with your friends. Why not with God? Just think about it every day. What has God done? Has he, when you think you're really having a very, very bad day, they write movies and books about that. Somebody that's had very, very bad days. But you know what, I choose. It's a choice to think about. I have a made-up mind that I'm going to think about what is good and not think about what is just the bad and the dream. There's enough of that being done. Just turn uh, the news on, look at what's on your computer screen, your phones. But when you open up the Word of God and you think about what God has done for you, amen, I just makes me want to shout and rejoice today. And how good. I always I always like to be the one in the house. I, I don't know if anybody else ever does this. When I'm in the house of the Lord and I go, God, you have been more good to me than anybody else. I wonder if anybody else, do you, do you just feel that way? Like, I wonder if God does this for everybody else like he does for me. Doesn't mean I don't have problems, but it's because of all of the problems. I go, God, you've really been good to me getting through all those problems. God is good. I think the more junk and stuff you go through, the more you realize the goodness of the Lord. He's the one. I think if you had everything just going right and hunky-dory all the time, you know, you wouldn't know what God, if you've never been through it all, then I'd never know all the problems that he gets off. Was that one song you did on Thanks, was that an Andre Crouch song? I thought so. 
I was like going, I felt that today. That was good. God is good. We're just glad you are here. I'm just happy in the Lord today. Is that okay? You know, the devil tried to wipe me out in 59 years, almost 60 now, pushing it this next year. 59 years. I bet you there's more times the devil's tried to wipe me out. I don't even know about the times because he's made me sure-footed like uh, the deer in the Bible like it talks about. And you know what? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this messed up world. It's just full of junk. Satan thinks he's got the upper hand, but he has no idea that the joy of the Lord is my strength. That when I'm going through the biggest trial, I just look at the Lord and say, God, you have been good to me. I think about it. You know what? Uh, people write books about the battlefield of the mind. You know what's in your mind? A lot of it is in your mind. Imaginations, offenses. We just think, uh, conjure all these things up in our mind. But when you get in the Word, it counteracts what's going on, right? I just, I am fired up. Lord, help the seniors at Brookdale today. Because we are taking the kids, and a lot of us are going over there. If you would like to go, we are fired up for Jesus. Um, at 1.30 and at 2.30, we have two services over at Brookdale. The kids have been busy the whole month of November making beautiful Thanksgiving cards. And they're going to be handing those out. And Alan Rosemary, you always have little treats or something to hand out also. And they'll be having service. And the kids are going to be singing. So that will be at 1.30 and at 2.30. And uh, I know they've been out there practicing, and a lot of the kids, with it being the break for Thanksgiving, I know they're gone and out of town, but uh, I know the ones that will be there, the seniors, they love it, the residents over there at the facility. And uh, five years ago today, we took the senior, or we took the children there, and my mom was in the facility, and we didn't think they were going to let the kids go into skilled nursing, if some of you remember that. And we were able to go in and sing to mom, and then mom just passed a few weeks after that. So uh, it's wonderful to bring a smile and bring some joy to the residents there. Uh, I remember my my mom was there twice, and uh, many times uh, the people would never have any visitors. Sometimes I would be the only one that would pop my head into some of the residents' rooms and say, hello, you know, it's Kim again saying hi to you. And I'd love to call them by name and to get them to verbally talk and communicate. So uh, hopefully we get to do that today. Be praying for the group that's going. And Alan, Rosemary, you guys do a, such a great job every month being so faithful to this ministry. I remember Al Valdez when you were talking about doing this years ago. Uh, and I remember the one line you told me, you said, this could be the last opportunity for somebody to give their heart to Jesus Christ. And you don't think about that. But through the years, I know Alan Rosemary have testified of that, the different ones that they give their hearts and life to Jesus Christ in their golden years as residents there at the facility. And so I love that opportunity that the doors are open. I I was just so surprised that they're letting us come in and do this. And uh, the little ones won't have to wear masks. I think some of us older ones, we did that last year. Uh, We had our mask on. So we'll just see. It depends. But uh, if you would like to join us, uh, see Alan, Rosemary, or myself afterwards. I know today is a busy day. We have uh, the 1.30 and the 2.30. But this evening, we are doing our evening of thanks. And this is a night that uh, we have been doing probably for 20 plus 25 years or longer at the church that Sunday night before Thanksgiving. Uh, And it's a wonderful time that we can remember and reflect on the goodness of the Lord this past year and uh, how good he's been to our families and good to us. And so uh, we'll be doing that tonight at 630 and immediately following our evening of thanks, we will go into our youth dessert auction again. This is something annually that we have done uh, probably 20 plus years. And the youth, it's a big fundraiser for our youth. I know a lot of ladies have been baking. My house yesterday 
smelled so good. I was up, because uh, I had to get, I didn't know this. I have a freshman grandson, and he's never wrestled. Well, he wanted to do wrestling, and he was st- staying with me this week. And we had to get up at 5.30 to get him over at the high school at 6.30 yesterday. And it's all day from 6.30 to 7. It was like almost a 12-hour day. Yeah. And uh, But while I was getting up, I was making blueberry muffins and cinnamon streusel muffins. The house was smelling so good. Today, it was different. I was up making chili. This morning, running down to the meat market here, I found a new meat market, making some chili. I think Mitch is making some, Janie's making some. I don't know if anybody else is. See me afterwards if you are. But we're going to serve chili before we start the dessert auction. And uh, I know we have that for everyone, for all the sweets then that will be following. And uh, I was just thinking, my car in the trunk smelled like blueberries and cinnamon, and inside my car, it smelled like chili. And so what a combination. I I don't know if I would be from having a chili candle, but uh, I was thinking yesterday, I go, blueberry and cinnamon candle would be pretty good, Uh, or just baked, right? But we're going to be doing that tonight, so I know so many have been baking, uh, doing that. And it's going to be a great time. So we hope you all can join us. I know at home you won't be able to, but you can leave a donation by giving. This is a great time for us to give. I'll just ease right into that. This is the time where you can give. Pay your tithe. And uh, you can do that through text to give. Uh, You can also do that online or by mail if you are here in person. We have our offering box in the back of the Uh, building there as you leave the building today after service, and you can drop that in there. But if you are not going to be here tonight, by some chance, you don't, you know, made other arrangements, we know what the holidays, and, uh, but we would love for you to leave an offering for our youth. Would that be okay? Just to do that, you can leave it in the offering box back there, make sure you mark on there, it's for our youth department, or online at home. And uh, you're missing out on the youth, but you're not going to miss out on the blessing that you can do uh, for our youth, what they'll be doing tonight. And I know that's a great time. Let's give our youth pastor, Mitch Cook, a hand. He's so faithful, so, so faithful. So uh, we just thank you for that. Now, this Wednesday, again, we've been doing this for years, uh, but the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, all the classes are canceled. And so we will not be having our Wednesday night class. Those that still bake and make or travel or do whatever, that way you get the Wednesday night off. And that's it. All the ladies say yay, or the men that cook too. Uh, But uh, that'll be great. I know Thursday, we just wish you all a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving on Thursday or Turkey Day and that you reflect on the goodness of the Lord. Uh, Next Sunday, we are very, very blessed to have our district youth directors with us, and that is going to be Jacob and Jessica Wallace. Their family will be here uh, ministering. How many have never met our youth directors, Jacob and Jessica Wallace? You've never met them. A lot of you have not. Oh, you all know them. Okay, good. Well, then you'll just get to see them again. And uh, that's great. And they will be here. There they are. They run our camps. Winter camp is already, they're talking it, getting it out there. Those, the winter camp is starting to be almost as big or bigger than our summer camp. It's really growing, doing good through the years. That will happen after the first of the year. But be here next Sunday. I know it's a four-day weekend. So many are traveling, taking the time off, starting to shop, uh, things for Christmas coming up. But uh, be here for the Wallaces, and uh, we need to encourage them and be a blessing. Can you all do that? Is that good? All right. Uh, We have some events that are happening that we need you to sign up for. Our Ladies Plaid and Pancakes Brunch is coming up. I came up with that idea. I go, well, I like plaid. I like pancakes. 
so why not just have we wear ladies plaid? And some of you thought, oh, we have to wear flannel pajamas. No, they got all kinds of Christmas plaid out there. It's not that at all. But if you have plaid flannel pajamas and you really want to wear them that day, go right ahead. But Sister Kim won't. Uh, I'm going to have uh, some plaid on. And we'll be eating pancakes. And if anybody does keto-free, gluten-free, whatever, making that, uh, I was thinking even potato pancakes are great. Uh, those would be great that you make with leftover mashed potatoes. And uh, so we'll be doing that. We just need you to sign up. We'll be doing the apron exchange, our joy uh, luncheon. We're going to have a potluck coming up on that also. That's going to be December the 15th in the fellowship hall. Sign up if you're going to that. And then our church family Christmas lunch is December the 11th. We need all sign-ups, most of these, especially that one because we cater in the lunch. And it's always a wonderful lunch that we'll be catering in. We just need to know usually the week of how many will be here. And I tell you what, on the 11th, the holidays is a great time for all of the church to be evangelists, right? Because we're telling everybody about Jesus. And so this is a great one that you can invite your friends in your family. Maybe you know somebody that uh, had a loss this last year, and they're just maybe a little down. It's been a rough year on them. Have them come out. And uh, you know what? When I've been down, and I don't want to be around happy people because I really just want to sit in my state of misery because it's so – does anybody else do that? Like when you walk into church – I'm confession, Pastor. You walk into church, you've had a bad week, and the worship team's up here singing all these happy songs, and you're just wanting the slow ones like I'm barely, if I can just make it through, Lord, you know, those songs. But, you know, after a song or two, it kind of lifts us up, and it's encouraging, and we definitely don't leave like we walked in. And so you never know. It might change somebody's life to invite them, especially to the luncheon. It's a great time. I promise we won't overload them too much, but uh, it's a great time to let them know they are loved, somebody's thinking about them, and Jesus still cares for them. Is that all right to do that? So pray about it. Pray about who you're going to invite, and uh, make sure you sign up there. That's going to be good. We have many other announcements I know happening. Uh, the kids are going to be here on Sunday morning, the 18th. Uh, they'll be up here singing and doing some stuff that day. A lot of you have asked about Christmas. How many of you realize Christmas is on a Sunday? Maybe I shouldn't have said. You didn't know. Christmas is on a Sunday. And you said, are we canceling Christmas because it's Christmas? Someone actually said that. Are we going to cancel Christmas because of Christmas, our service? So I talked to Pastor, and I said, I don't, I know others are. Some are doing Christmas Eve services. You normally do a Christmas Eve communion. We're not going to do that. We're going to do a Christmas Day communion service at 10 a.m., be about an hour. And uh, we'll try to keep it shorter. But Pastor and I prayed about it, and we just, for us at our church, we felt like we couldn't cancel uh, the Christmas service because of Christmas. And uh, so, you know, yeah, I know, there, there's something to that thinking. Uh, and if I just thought, you know what, get up early, open your gifts, uh, or have a late lunch sometime that you can plan. But bring your family if they're here visiting. Uh, is that okay to bring those that are here visiting with you, the church doors, and pastor, it might just be me and you. But, oh, no, he says, no, it won't. He has so much more faith than me. Yeah. I always say, who, who knows, but uh, if you would like to be here, uh, that will, we will be doing that for those that will. And so we're excited about that, and thank you back there to our media and our sound and everybody. Let's give them a hand. They do fantastic back there. Uh, love you all very much. You are awesome. Uh, well, are you all ready for the word? Let's give our pastor a hand as he comes up. Amen. All right. Well, 
thank God for announcements. Amen. We don't want anybody. Paul said he didn't want anyone to be ignorant. <laughs> right? So that just means I'm knowing, I've learned. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we, w- we want you to be aware of everything going on. I want to give a little plug for tonight. Um, do you know that uh, the pilgrims that came to our country, they rightfully celebrated um, their thankfulness to the Lord for bringing them through uh, tremendous hardships by having a feast. But that was not the first Thanksgiving feast in history. Did you know that? Uh, biblically, uh, Thanksgiving feasts begin all the way back in the books, book of Chronicles with uh, King David. And uh, Jesus, in the New Testament, before he went to the cross, he sat down with his disciples. And the Bible says, and after giving thanks, he broke the bread. I, I tell you, that is a, a celebration. It is a commemoration of thanksgiving to the Lord for what he has done. And just like Kim said, how can we, in fact, Christmas means Christ Mass. So, you know, coming to church, celebrating, remembering is what Christmas is all about. You don't throw a birthday party for someone and not honor them. Right? And so Thanksgiving is is sort of the same. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He didn't say how often to do it. It should never be a ritual for us, but in special moments, we need to come together and honor God, and we need to do it. You'll you'll be with your family on Thursday, but the church is a family. We are the family of God, and so I just want to give a little plug uh, for that, and also the desserts that come out of that dessert auction are wonderful, and so you don't have to go down to Marie Callender's or someplace like that. You can bless the youth, and you can get your desserts here tonight, right? Right after the communion service. And it is a, it is a Thanksgiving service. It's going to be a short service. But uh, the, the emphasis and the highlight of the service tonight is on communion with the Lord and honoring God, uh, Thanksgiving with the church family, with the family of God. Is that all right? All right. I believe that's the will of God, don't you? And so for you that are here, try to come back. If you're watching by Facebook for some reason, you're our celebration family or a guest and you, uh, you couldn't be here this morning, but your schedule is free tonight, we invite you to come back, all right? And so uh, looking forward to, to seeing you here. I want to preach a little bit different Thanksgiving uh, message this year. Um, go to a very familiar passage of Scripture. And that is the 23rd Psalm. It's said by many uh, that it is the most beloved psalm of all. The Lord is my shepherd. It's a psalm of the shepherd. And I want to read the entire 23rd Psalm, the just six verses long. And then we're going to, um, we're actually going to get into this today. Shouldn't take too long, I don't think. That's what I always say, right? All right. Psalm chapter 23. I think we could almost quote this together, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Thank God. Anybody here today feel like that the blessings of the Lord just make your cup run over? Amen? Surely. We know that goodness and mercy shall follow us, but the psalmist says, surely. This is a fact. This is a, there's not many sure things in life anymore, but when the Lord is your shepherd, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. How long? All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house or in the presence of the Lord forever. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. The 23rd Psalm is one of the best loved passages in the entire Bible. 
Uh, it is probably most quoted of, uh, of scriptures, and I don't know many that are more quoted than the 23rd Psalm. It is often read at times of stress and despair and sorrow. I have uh, stood with families at, in times of loss and grief, and uh, that psalm has comforted them. But this morning, I want to present it a little bit, slightly different uh, to you in a different way. We're in the harvest season. We're in the fall season. I know it doesn't feel like it today. It's chilly enough to be dead winter, right, here in Bakersfield this morning. But we've been talking a lot, especially on Wednesday night, about the harvest. And I believe that not only are we in the harvest time of the year, but I believe that the church is entering a great season of harvest. I really do. And so we are in the harvest season. And of course, Thanksgiving Day, as we commemorate it, we honor that very first Thanksgiving, uh, giving honor to God for bringing our forefathers through, for his blessings all along the way. And today, I would like to present this psalm and give you three reasons, only three. There are so many more that we could preach, but give you three reasons to be thankful to God. How many know that everybody has a reason to be thankful? No matter what's going on in your life, everybody has a reason to be thankful. Amen? But, um, you know, sometimes we tend to see the, the difficulties, even though we're surrounded by blessings, but we don't see the blessings. And so the 23rd Psalm begins with these familiar words. It doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. It doesn't say, uh, you know, it, it, could, it, it can put it in all sorts of different ways. And it would mean something different. But the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd. There is, there is, a, uh, there is a personal statement or a personal feeling in this, that the Lord is not just any shepherd. He's not just someone else's shepherd. He's not just a shepherd. He's not just a shepherd to Israel or a shepherd to the masses. But the psalmist made it so personal. The Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. That's a pretty strong statement. Because some people, I, I remember preaching in the scripture one time about how the psalmist said, I once was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And someone in the church that day said, I, you know, I, I have a little issue with that because, because I have seen the seed of the righteous that, uh, that are begging bread. But today, when, 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 when we look at this, it, it means that, that we shall have what we need. That there is, there is uh, nothing, especially spiritually, uh, physically, whatever. We, we have what we need. Paul says it, and my God shall supply all of my need. Right? According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so the psalmist makes this very definite, very... Uh, there's no hesitation. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And because I, he is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. And when someone makes this statement, it, it makes us kind of set up and take notice. Because there are a lot of people today that are in want. And there are many believers that feel like that they're in want. Let me explain. There is, a, there is something that I've used before. Some of you that have been in the church for years have probably heard me use this, this little kind of a poem. A man by the name of Jason Lehman wrote this. It says, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall that I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but then it was winter that I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. 
It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I, you know, toward the end of the summers in Bakersfield, I get feeling weary of the heat. Don't you? And uh, I'll say, boy, I'll be glad when this is over. And my wife, don't you just love it when, you're, when your spouse just kind of straightens out your thinking a little bit? And she says, yeah, but when we get in the dead of winter, you're going to miss some of those warm days of summer. Seems like we're always discontent where we are, right? He goes on, Jason Lima, to say, I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted. The freedom and the respect. <laughs> I was 20, boy, I want to be 20, right? But it was 30 that I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 that I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. Then my life was over, and I never got what I wanted. But the psalmist brings a cure us today for that feeling, we are living in an age of discontent, and we have been here not just for a few years or even a few decades. We have been in this age of discontent for a long time. Many of the biblical characters were, were discontent with, with their status or the place they were in, but Paul somehow must have tapped in to the resource of the statement of the of the shepherd. David was a shepherd that was making a statement about the shepherd, right? Because Paul says, I have learned. Everybody say learn. You see, it doesn't happen automatically because it is in our human nature to be discontented. But the apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. That is a, there is a learning process in contentment. I believe it comes through the word. I, became, I think maybe it comes with some of life's situations that we go through and we, 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 we become better. We have two choices to become bitter or to become better. But Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatsoever state I am in. He said, I've learned to be without and I've learned to have much. I've learned to be abased and I've learned how to abound. How many have ever read that in the scripture, run across that scripture. So I, I, I want to talk about, I want to zero in on this today about truly I shall not be in want because it's impossible to, to be thankful when we're so in want, we're so discontent with the things that we have. And there's an old song that we used to sing when I was growing up as a kid. It says, count your blessings. Name them. I think maybe we need to name some of our blessings today. We need to go into this Thanksgiving week instead of naming our problems, which seems to be the order of things today. We need to start naming our blessings. Amen? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. We have enjoyed the goodness of God sometimes even then when we don't realize that we are enjoying the goodness of God. Amen? Many people never seem to be satisfied and almost everybody wants more. A little child wants more toys and more television time. A teenager wants more freedom and popularity. Most adults want more possessions. Come on, somebody and leisure time. And as we age, we want more health, more friends, more loyalty from our children. But it seems like that everybody wants something. And yet the psalmist here, this is not, this is not in a time of, of his life that he was, in fact, the, the 23rd Psalm, probably the most quoted, one of the most beautiful songs, uh, from, from what I can figure out and track it down chronologically, and sometimes that's difficult to do, 
Uh, it was written not before David's great transgression and fall and then his restoration. It was written after. He had found out. He had lived enough life to realize that the secret of his success, the secret of his life was not about him. It was not about what he had. It was not about his possessions. It was not about any of these other things. It was about the Lord being his shepherd. And maybe he, he found that key because, because he learned how to be the shepherd of Israel. He learned how to be the king of Israel by tending his father's sheep, even though it was insignificant at the time. They didn't even bother to call David in from the sheepfold or out in the field when Samuel came down to the house of Jesse to anoint a king. But the shepherd saw something that it is because of the shepherd. It's because of Jesus. It's because of the good shepherd. It's because of the one that in him we live and move and have our being. That, that's, because I that, that's why I love that song. We sing it often here. But it's all because of Jesus that, I, that I'm alive. He's the reason that I breathe. He's the reason that I have my life. He's the reason that I have my health. He's the reason that I, that I am not condemned and doomed to a devil's hell, which was rightfully my place. But because he took my place and in my stead, I am free to live and to move. It is because he is my shepherd today that I shall not be in want. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. For I am the vine, and you are the branches. And just like I am in my Father, and I receive the life of my Father, you are in me, and that's the reason you, that is the way that you receive the life of our Father and from me, because I am the vine, I am the source, you are the branches. Paul says, so that you may know. what he, he is preaching and he says, so that you may know, all of you, that there is life in Jesus' name. Jesus said, the thief come not, comes not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life. So Jesus says, without me, the life that is in me, without me, you can do nothing. Paul later comes along in the book of Colossians and says, if you have Jesus, then you have not just enough, you have everything. Paul says to his son in the Lord, Timothy, for he has given us all things, not some things, everything that we have, everything afforded to us, everything we acquire and everything that we ever could acquire, he has given them to us so that we may richly enjoy them. That's pretty good. It's the Father's good pleasure. I could go on and on. Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. And Paul says, and the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness. You read that? And peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. Let's bring up Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And we're going to read it from the New International Version today. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Can we say that today? Can we go into Thanksgiving 2022 coming out of a pandemic in the midst of a, well, they say it's not a recession, but in the midst of financial insecurities, amen, national, global insecurities, can we say, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Hello. I have learned the secret. Everybody say secret. I'm going to share a secret with you today. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, I, I mean, I'm quoting it. I didn't write it. Paul did, right? But it's, it's significant for us. 
Holy Spirit put his seal on it. All scripture is God-breathed. It is given to us, right? So obviously, God wants us to be a happy. I mean, say amen to that. God wants us to be a happy, satisfied people. I don't think he wants us to be restless. Hello? You ever just seen people just so restless? Right? We, we have people restless today. He doesn't want us to, to have to be restless or jealous. Right? You see, I'm reminded of that, 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 that scripture where those who came early in the day and were promised a certain wage by, by the master, and then those came in late in the day, and the master, because of his generosity, paid them the same. It was those. It didn't take anything out of their pocket, but they had exception with those who were given the same amount that came late in the day. And as long as we have that, that attitude, we cannot truly be thankful. Well, why did they receive that when they... When they didn't, they didn't earn it. I want to tell you something today, folks. We didn't earn anything that we have. We didn't, oh, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I've done this. Look at my accomplishments. Moses reminded the children of Israel, he said, when you go into the promised land and you are living in houses that you did not build and you're enjoying the prosperity of vineyards that you did not plant. He said, I, I, I admonish you. In fact, he is commanding them. You remember and don't forget the Lord that it is the Lord your God that has given you the power to get wealth. Amen. So you see, if I can't rise up in the morning and take a breath... And roll out of bed and plant my feet firmly on the floor and start making preparations for the day that I'm going out and I'm God is going to prosper and he's going to give the strength so that we can earn a living and be blessed because the scripture says let him that stole steal no more but rather let them work with the work of their hands come on somebody Six days, the scripture says, shall a man work. I've heard people say, when we talk about the Malachi scripture, prove me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that you can't contain it. And I had somebody right in this church a few years ago say to me, Pastor, I've tithed all my life and I've never experienced a blessing that, that I couldn't contain. And I said, well, now, wait a minute. It was just a couple weeks ago that you complained to me. You said that they were giving you so much overtime that you were getting enough rest and relaxation. And you turned down some of that overtime because you felt like it was taking away time from your family. And they said, oh, yeah, I guess. That was God blessing me to the place where I couldn't even, I couldn't contain it. I had to say, shut it off. Amen? We just want God to rain pie out of the sky, don't we, sometimes? And yet God says, I will supply what you have need of according to your riches and glory. There are not any self-made men or self-made women. Because unless the Lord gave us the health and the strength to arise and face the day, and I can tell you this, that it could be gone, it could be taken away with one diagnosis. Three reasons. I haven't got to them just yet. I'm setting them up. God doesn't want us to be restless, jealous. He doesn't want us to be a complaining people. That incensed God, that angered God, the children of Israel in the wilderness, for them always murmuring and complaining. Wow. You know, the opposite of complaining is thankfulness. Hello? I'm not talking about just saying we're thankful, but being thankful. There's a difference. Getting quiet in the potter's house. There should be a spirit of thankfulness in every believer. There should be 
the, this awe of who God is in our life and where we would be without Him. Amen? Wow. Our thankfulness, that spirit of thankfulness is, we, we, we hear a lot about branding today. Well, I want to tell you, that is what brands the child of God. That is the branding of the church. It, it tells the world out there that there is a difference and that we belong to him. Because we are thankful to him, because we realize that our dependence is upon him. Are you ready for those three I'm going to start them, and we're going to get to them together. You thought I was going to say quickly, didn't you? I didn't. Philippians 4 and 19. Here's the first one. Write it down if you're a note taker. In this life, the shepherd gives us all we need. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. I won't stop there and preach. I could. It's not the riches of, of man. It's not the riches of government. It's not the riches of, of, uh, uh, of our company that we work with. It is according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Got to remind ourselves of that. That's a secret. So in this life, the good shepherd gives us all we need. Frequently in the Bible, we're compared to sheep. And we think, oh, isn't that cute? The sheep is so cuddly, and they're so warm and cozy, and they've got just such a sweet disposition. Well, can I tell you something? It's not a compliment. Being compared to sheep, it sounds nice, but surely we must realize that this is not a compliment. Why? Because sheep are some of the dumbest and dirtiest animals in the world. <laughs> Rocking some of your world. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. This will tell you a little bit about the personality and the thinking of sheep. All we like have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And of course, the Lord has laid on him, Jesus. God has laid upon Jesus the iniquities of us all. But we are like sheep when we go astray. Sounds good. Some of us would rather be compared to sheep than something else, but it's really not a compliment. It's it's not. So, what do we get from this? If the Lord is our shepherd, let's look at Matthew 9 and verse 36 in the uh, New King James Version. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them. Jesus has compassion on the multitude. He has compassion on us. Why? Because he said they were weary. Anybody ever been weary? And they were scattered like what? Sheep. Sheep can be weary. Sheep can go astray. Sheep can be scattered. Right? So here he's comparing us to sheep. Philip Keller was a sheep rancher who was also a preacher who wrote a book that has now became a classic. Some of you have asked me about this book before when we've been teaching along the same lines. And now it's, I think it's out of print, but you can find it online. But it, it's called A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm. And Philip Killer has some unique insight to the 23rd Psalm because, just like David, David had unique insight, could write this, was qualified to write this because he was a shepherd. And Philip Keller wrote this book, A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm, with a very unique insight. And I want us to look at some of the things that Philip Keller observed in his book. Philip Keller said, 
Sheep require more attention than any other livestock. Sound familiar? They just can't take care of themselves. Well, I've got news for us today. He calls us sheep because we require attention. It's me again, Lord. Right? And we just can't. We need a caretaker. We just can't take care of ourselves. Number two, unless their shepherd makes them move on. Remember in the psalm, it says, he leads me beside the still waters, right? Unless a shepherd makes them move on, sheep will actually ruin a pasture. By eating every blade of grass until they, 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 they turn a fertile pasture into nothing but barren soil. If the shepherd does not make them move on. Sound familiar? Number three. Sheep are nearsighted. Did you know that? <laughs> I think we are too. Oh, the Lord's never done anything for me. Right? We're nearsighted. Sheep, according to a shepherd, Philip Keller... Sheep are nearsighted and very stubborn. But easily frightened. They have no defense. And really, truly, they are feeble creatures. Their only recourse is to, <laughs> is to run. That's the reason so many, you see so many of God's people running. Paul said in, in, in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. And this is not new with, 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 it's not unique to me. But when you read the armor, you realize that there is a, a protection for every place on your body but your back. Because a soldier should never run. David ran out to meet Goliath at the Valley of Elah, challenging him. Not running behind. The Bible says he ran out to meet him. Amen. Can you imagine that? Shepherd boy, ready complexion, young, facing a man of war that stood over nine feet tall. And he ran out to meet him. Let's get back to the sheep. Their only recourse is to run if the shepherd is not there to protect them. Here's another one I didn't know. Sheep have absolutely no homing instincts. A dog, a cat, a horse, birds, even a cow have homing instincts. But once they're lost, they cannot find their way home without help. It's gone. The sheep is utterly lost and gone unless someone rescues the sheep. Does that sound familiar to you? I'm just asking. Does that sound familiar? So as a shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm, note that some things he observes sounds a lot like us that Jesus refers to as sheep. So one overriding principle, listen if you hear nothing else in this message today. If you would only take one statement home of the message that I'm preaching on this Thanksgiving Sunday, the overriding principle of the 23rd Psalm is that sheep cannot make it without the shepherd. We can't. We can't. But we try. And we don't recognize when he is there. Many times we don't recognize that the shepherd is calling us or the shepherd is moving us or the shepherd is leading us or the shepherd is helping us and we complain about things that really he is allowing in our lives to get us to move on to green pastures that lay ahead of us. We need, I need, 
You need the shepherd. No matter what your calling, no matter what your place in life, no matter how you were born, whether you were born into, uh, into position or whether you were born uh, into poverty, I want to tell you something today. No one, there is no one that does not need the hand of the shepherd in their life today. I'm preaching better than you're a man in today, I can tell you that. Amen. That's the only way that he could say. He couldn't make the final analysis without the preceding statement. He could not say, I shall not be in want without first recognizing the Lord is my shepherd. Would you just lift up your hand to the Lord? And just say, I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you. You're my shepherd. You're not just my king. You're my shepherd king. And I know that I would not make it. I would not be here without you. I recognize your hand in my life today, Lord. You are the shepherd. You're not just a shepherd or you're not just the good shepherd, but you are my shepherd. And I recognize that today. Let's follow the sheep just a little bit more. The second, if you're taking notes, David says, this is what the good shepherd does for his sheep. This is also in the psalm. Number one, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Let's think about that for a minute. He leads his sheep to a lush pasture where they have plenty to eat until their stomach is full. That is what he is saying. When you see that little statement, he makes me lie down, he makes me lie down. And a shepherd knows this about the sheep. When you get a true picture of the sheep in your mind, a sheep will lie down only when they are completely satisfied. There isn't any desire for anything more. So content that they lie down. Wow. They won't lie down if there's any fear of a predator in the area without the shepherd. There, there are a few of us that, 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 that go hungry. Hello? Very, 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 very in this nation of ours. In America, we have so much to eat that dieting is a constant discipline. Now think about that. Most people, now I'm not going to say there is no hunger and, and homelessness we know is a problem. We know that there are some core issues behind some of that that need to be solved before we can solve the problem. But I will tell you this, that you don't hear people say, I've got to start eating more, near as much as you hear them say, I need to go on a diet. I t I'll tell Kim, I just, ha I just have to lose a little weight. I just have to quit eating the fast food that I'm eating on the run because I don't have the time or I don't take the time. You see, <laughs> he makes me lie down. This is, I, I'm not laughing at, at you. I'm laughing at, at, I mean, this is, this is, is it, it just is so, seems so real and so true for most of us. Note the wording. He makes me lie down. Sheep sometimes have to be forced to lie down. <laughs> for a sheep to lie down, four things are required. First, they must be full. Second, they must be unafraid. They won't lie down until they're not fearful. The littlest suspicion of a wolf or a coyote or a bear, and they stand ready to flee. Third, sheep won't lie down unless there's harmony in the flock. Now think about that. This, is, this, this one is what rocked my world. If there's friction over the budding order among them, they won't relax. But the shepherd, 
makes us lie down. Oh, we have conflict in the family, Pastor. We have conflict in the church. We have conflict in the marriage. We have conflict in ministry. We have conflict on the job. We have these things. And yet we can trust the shepherd. Conflict. And then finally, they must be completely content. If there's flies or if there's fleas that are bothering them, they won't lie down. They must be content to lie down. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I thought back about this. And I thought, boy, Lord, when have you ever made me lie down? Again, we complain about so many other things. I've complained. I have, I'll just be honest. I've been angry at God before. I know that none of you have ever done that. You've never said it. And, and because you were afraid to say it. You were afraid to admit it and verbalize it. But in your heart, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And I will tell you, I have been angry at God at times. I've gone through those periods, those trials, those things that I have faced that I just could not understand why God would allow my circumstances if he truly loved me. And I would complain and begin to tell him of what a good child I have been. While the others were out laying out of church, I've been in church, Lord. In fact, I cut my teeth on the pews. My mama made me the Pentecostal palate and drugged me. I was a drug baby. I was drugged to church every time the door was open. And I'll remind God, listen, I'll be the first one to stand up and give God my credentials of my faithfulness when I believe that he has somehow shut off the blessing and allowing some things into my life. But I will tell you this, I look back now over those times that I thought God was, was harming me and I could see now that God was moving me from that pasture. Listen, God will never open a new door at times until the old door is closed and we stand there complaining about the old door. I'm talking about thankfulness here today, in case you're wondering. God must make me lie down once in a while. We rush around here and there trying to meet this obligation, that obligation, or make that engagement. In our hurry and scurry, we tend to miss the things that are most important. Once in a while, God has to say to us, you need to lie down. Like a kid, you know. You need to go to bed, you're tired. No, I'm not tired. I don't need a nap. Oh, yeah, you need a nap. The problem is most of us go, if you don't go lie down and take a nap, I'm going to put you to sleep. Oh, I'm so thankful that our loving Heavenly Father does not do that. But I've had some times that He has made me lie down. And I don't like it. Every once in a while, despair, heartbreak, illness, loss, etc., it, 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 it makes us reevaluate our priorities. But as long as I have the shepherd, there have been times, especially when our kids were little, and we'd go through difficulties and whatever, and I'd be thinking about this or that, and, you know, it's been said that a pastor resigns his church every Monday morning at times, and I can tell you that that's true sometimes, not all the time. But I remember making statements to, to Kim. I would say, honey, as long as I've got you and our babies, we can go anywhere and be happy. And now I know this, as long as I've got the shepherd, Satra Baba Bakasada Laba. As long as the shepherd is leading me. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. 
from pasture to pasture, from place to place, then I shall not be discontent. If the Lord is not your shepherd, here's the last one, if the Lord is not your shepherd, he has come looking for you today. (laughs) Out there watching Facebook, if the Lord is not your shepherd, he has come looking for you today. For the good shepherd secures the ninety and nine, and then he goes and looks for the one lost. And if you can't find your way home, he will lead you and put you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And cause goodness and mercy to follow you all of the days of your life. And you will be in his presence forever. I love this story that I'm going to read to you now. It just seemed to fit so well today. Many years ago, one of England's leading actors was asked to recite for the pleasure of his fellow guest. He consented and asked if there was anything special that his audience would like to hear. After a moment's pause, an old clergyman present said, Sir, could you recite to us the 23rd Psalm? A strange look passed over the actor's face, and he paused for a moment. And then said, I can, and I will, upon one condition. And that's that after I have recited it, you, my friend, will do the same. The clergyman said, I, in surprise, but I'm not eloquent like you are. However, if you wish it, I'll do it. So impressively, the actor comes to the front of the audience that that gathering. And the great actor begins the psalm. His voice and his intonation were perfect. The Lord is my shepherd. He held his audience spellbound, as he quoted. And as he finished, there was a great burst of applause broke from the guests. And they gave him ovations and stood to their feet and applauded the eloquence of the actor as he quoted the 23rd Psalm. And then as the claps, the cheers begin to die away, the old clergyman arose and began the psalm. His voice was not remarkable. His intonation was not faultless. In fact, his voice quivered a little bit as he spoke. From time to time, he was given to emotion in his voice, and when he had finished, there was no sound of applause to break the silence. But there was not a dry eye in the room. Heads were bowed. The great actor rose to his feet again. His voice shook. And he laid his hand upon the shoulder of the old preacher. And he said to the audience, I reached your eyes and I reached your ears, my friends. He reached your heart. The difference is just this. I know the 23rd Psalm. But the preacher knows the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd? I mean, do you really know the shepherd? Have you tried him? Have you just utterly had to just rely on him and him alone? You see, 
if you don't take Jesus and Jesus alone, you don't add, today they're adding all these, you know, it's okay to, to have Jesus, but we've got to add all these other things to him. The Lord is my shepherd, period. The Lord is your shepherd, period. The Lord is the shepherd. I shall not want. That does not mean that there won't be things that we feel like we have to have from time to time. It means I won't be discontent. I won't be in this, this feeling of lack that I'm without. I'm content to know that the Lord is my shepherd, and as long as he's my shepherd, then everything's going to work out all right. Do you have that feeling, that knowingness in your heart today? If you do, you can be thankful. But it's going to be pretty hard to be thankful until we get that worked out. Because then it's going to breed discontentment, again, like we talked about in complaining and failure to thrive. Amen? Are you tracking with me still? Stand to your feet. Let's lift up our hands to the Lord and let's thank him for his word. I thank you, good shepherd. Oh, so many times I have needed to hear your voice. But I know that you're there. You're with me. Your rod and your staff comforts me. You've even prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies at times, shepherd. You've anointed my head with oil. I know you're there. Sometimes I fail to see it. Sometimes I fail to recognize that it's your voice when you're speaking to me. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Take just a moment. Let's just talk to Jesus. If you want to lift up your hands, you want to bow your head, if you want to, but, but just, just talk to Jesus for a moment. The shepherd, a good shepherd, cares about his sheep. I love you, God. I bless you and I praise you. God, there's somebody that is present today that that they so desperately need to hear this word and get it in their spirit. There are people watching out on Facebook and will watch as this goes to video to YouTube in the next few days and God, they need to hear this word. I'm confident of that. I feel that in my spirit today because you want us to be satisfied and not discontent. So, Lord, come move in our lives, shepherd. We're going through the valley. Some are going through the valley of the shadow of death. But you're there with us, Lord. You're with us. In fact, you're never not with us. Is there anybody here today that would say, Pastor, listen, I, I really need to put some things in perspective as I go into this season. I need to realize that as long as I've got the shepherd in my life, that I can be satisfied going from day to day, from week to week, month to month, and he will supply my needs because he's my shepherd. How many would lift your hand with me? This has been an eye-opener for me at this time of year. 
may lift your hand and say, I need to put this in perspective today, Pastor. I need to chew on this a little bit and put it in perspective. Anybody here? All right. Father, those that lifted their hand, I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be open. In fact, Holy Spirit, put a seal on this word in their heart. I reach their heads, but you reach their hearts. And Lord, I pray that you seal this in their hearts because as we look around us, it does not seem to be that everything is right. And Lord, when we don't think that everything is right, we tend to be discontent with the way that things are. We run. But God, help us at this Thanksgiving time to be truly thankful. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so because God, we recognize the providential hand of the shepherd upon our life. We are the sheep of your pasture. Bring understanding, God. Bring revelation. Bring enlightenment and bring encouragement today because we know your place in our lives and we know your your plan for our lives and we know that you are always there. You are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you, I want to turn this just a little bit before we go home uh, today, but how many of you say, you know what, you don't, don't be, you know, we're, I'm not doing this so that you can start having bad thoughts about somebody, but how many can think of somebody in your mind that, that really need a shepherd to come to them? They just really need the shepherd to come to them. Because they, they need a change. I'm going to say an attitude or a thinking. Not because we're so right and they're so wrong. They're just in need today. We have someone on our heart that they're in need of a shepherd to come to them. Help me lift up your hand and say, I'm not going to speak names. I just, I just really would like, I, keep your hand up. I want to pray. Father, you know the name. You have put your handprint on them in their DNA. <laughs> God and their fingerprints. You have, you have made them so unique because, God, you know everything about them. They're not a number. They're not a statistic to you, Lord. You're the shepherd. You know every one of the sheep to the place that you know when the one is missing. And, Father, today I pray that you go to that one, their name. We put their name in the blank. And, God, let them see the reality of the shepherd in their life. God, so that they... God, every, every longing that they have can be met. In Jesus' name, we bring them before your throne. And those who believe that that prayer was effectual said, Amen, Amen. How many are going to have a great Thanksgiving this year? With true thankfulness because you know the shepherd. Amen. So put your hands this way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon each of you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave, you have something you want to say? Okay. God bless you. Have a very blessed Thanksgiving.